skin cancer, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, five different versions of leukemia, juvenile diabetes, Crohn's disease, rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, sickle cell anemia, jawbone replacement, and osteoporosis. These are a dozen or so of the diseases for which adult stem cell research has provided some therapy, not necessarily a cure, but some amelioration of the condition. Adult stem cells, as you might know, are found in blood, bone, teeth, umbilical cord blood, fat. What a cheery thought that is, some use for fat. Using them doesn't destroy any human life, but as you can see, it has produced several therapies, some 60 or for some 60 to 70 diseases. No one is against stem cell research, only destroying embryos in the process. Embryonic stem cell research, by contrast, dissolves the exterior of an embryo in order to extract the stem cells within, thus destroying the embryo in order to establish a stem cell line. Embryonic stem cell research then destroys an embryo and to date has produced no therapies. So if you read in the newspapers, so-and-so patient was treated with a stem cell therapy, it's automatically an adult stem cell therapy. And there does seem to be a sort of journalistic formula designed to embarrass those who oppose embryonic stem cell research. It goes like this. A patient was treated with, uh, with stem cell therapy. This latest study on embryonic stem cell research shows great promise. Some people are opposed to embryonic stem cell therapy for shame. But this journalistic formula is a bit misleading because it capitalizes on adult stem cell successes in order to suggest the potential of embryonic stem cell research. Now, on the other side of the debate, there's also a pro-life formula, if you will, that states the truth but does not really get to the core problem of embryonic stem cell research. That pro-life formula goes something like this. Embryonic stem cell search is wrong because it does not work. Well, it's, it's true that we, morally we should not do things that we know don't work. But embryonic stem cell research might work. It might produce therapies. We might hear of someone cured from leukemia, for example, with an embryonic stem cell research therapy. It may very well be bring cures in the future, but even in that case, it will still be immoral because it destroys the embryo. And adult stem cell research is effective and successful, but it's moral because it doesn't destroy an embryo. Perhaps, perhaps you can see from this back and forth the difficulty of forming a conscience on this issue. It requires the moral evaluation of a series of actions, which require for their understanding not only moral and philosophical knowledge and a theological perspective, but also scientific knowledge as well. And now, to make, to make the, the issue more difficult, imagine a whole population of citizens understanding this issue well enough to come to a judgment on it. Perhaps then you can note the difficulty of rising to the call of what John Paul II advocated, a general mobilization of consciences. A general mobilization of consciences sufficient able, and able to confront and solve today's unprecedented problems affecting human life and capable of bringing about a serious and courageous cultural dialogue among all parties. John Paul II, curiously enough, said that Christians need to begin this dialogue and to prepare for this dialogue within their own communities. Because sometimes Christians don't form their consciences 
well and sometimes engage in practices that deform them, deform those consciences. John Paul II wrote, too often it happens for believers, even those who take an active part in the life of the church, end up by separating the Christian faith from its ethical requirements concerning life and thus fall into a moral subjectivism and certain objectionable ways of acting." End quote. And John Paul II pointed out the bedrock principle of forming that conscience, the inviolable and incomparable dignity and worth of every human life, as a bedrock principle for starting the formation of conscience. And a part, he proposed a sort of formation of conscience along two lines, both difficult. First of all, understanding correctly just what, how the principle of the inviolable dignity of life establishes a certain personal rights. It grounds personal rights. And then second of all, working through and trying to address some of the false ag arguments that under, systematically undermine the dignity of human life. John Paul II wrote, when freedom is detached from objective truth, it becomes impossible to establish personal rights on a firm, rational basis. And the ground is laid for society to be at the mercy of the unrestricted will of individuals or the oppressive totalitarianism of public authority. And to make the efforts to form conscience even more difficult, we do this in a culture that trivializes sexuality and makes it all the more difficult to love life in all of its different conditions and circumstances. He wrote, the trivialization of sexuality is among the principal factors which have led to a contempt for new life. Only a true love is able to protect life. I think that the, the current debate about stem cell research, and as I will argue, its underlying problem of in vitro fertilization show us the difficulty of this mobilization of consciences. Let's consider for just a moment only a few, maybe three, of the arguments in favor of embryonic stem cell research. A well-known Catholic bioethicist named Father Tad Pokolchik has gone through and systematically addressed and refuted many of these, and I'll only give you a summary of a two or three. But I think this will lead us to a reflection upon the underlying problem of in vitro fertilization and its connection with the, uh, with the industry now that's forming around embryonic stem cell research. For example, some proponents of embryonic stem cell research simply argue that science must examine everything. The logic goes like this, science studies everything. Embryonic stem cells exist and therefore science must study them without regulation. The problem is, with this argument, that society rightfully regulates scientists without infringing upon scientific freedom. Let me give you a completely unscientific example. Suppose I have a plumber come to my house to fix the pipes. I'm not going to tell the plumber what pipes to use, how to orient them for optimal efficiency, how to connect them to each other. But if the plumber decides to install lead pipes in the basement of my house, well, I have something to say about that. Why? Because the lead pipes are likely to compromise my health, my family's health, and the health of anyone to whom I sell the house and anyone who owns the house in the future. Similarly, we leave scientists free to develop their own methods of investigation and their own technical language for explaining to us what they're doing. But we rightly criticize some uses of those methods and using that technical language in a misleading fashion. Now let's consider a second argument. Some people will argue that embryos are not human. They're not equal to a human person, a human being. The argument goes like this. Embryos should not be considered human individuals until they are implanted in the uterus. Until implantation, after all, you might have twins. How can we be sure? that we already have an individual, if later on we might have two individuals. The response to this objection would be, 
in twinning, one individual exists from conception and then gives rise to a second individual. Biology is quite familiar with the phenomenon of asexual reproduction. Implantation only enab enables the embryo to nourish itself and to continue its, de its development toward adulthood. Now let me take up one more argument, one that is quite compelling to many people and involves fertility clinics, where infertile couples tr go to try to have children through in vitro fertilization, commonly called IVF. These clinics take sperm and eggs from the couple's bodies, produce, say, 8 to 12 embryo in vitro, that is, in a laboratory dish, discard the defective embryos, implant the strongest in the uterus of the wife and future mother, and freeze the rest for possible future pregnancies. The argument for embryonic stem cell research is that the spare embryos that won't eventually be implanted will just die. And so we could bring some good from this situation by using them for research, even though it destroys them in the process. Well, the error here, one error here is to, one error here is that the ability to foresee a person's death is no justification for killing them. According to that criterion, Anyone here in this room could be killed because at some time we're all going to die. Also according to that criterion, in our hospitals, patients with transplantable organs might be killed because death is imminent. But rather, we continue to care for those patients, so we continue to maintain embryos in a frozen state until they naturally die, or perhaps until a morally acceptable way of rescuing them becomes an option. Well, some of the most ardent proponents of embryonic stem cell research recognize that they cannot justify destroying embryos because they are going to die anyway. Instead, they argue that embryo destructive research is legitimate if couples donate embryos to science. Just as a person can donate his body for use in scientific research after death. The obvious difference in this analogy is that, unlike a corpse, an embry the embryos are not dead, which explains why scientists want them. Moreover, our culture's emphasis on freedom and choice makes it e easy to overlook the fact that these embryos are not dead, and then to accept the argument that parents should be able to choose donation for stem cell research. After all, some couples will struggle with what to do with their spare embryos, now likening those embryos to the chattering children they now happily have. If they are conflicted about letting their embryonic children die versus implanting them and expanding their family, then embryo donation might bring them some peace, the argument goes. But in the midst of this struggle, we forget that they are orphans. By their consent, the parents place their children in the custody of others, though we would never call it an adoption, maybe an institutionalization. Now, the idea that parental consent justifies the use of embryos for research also justifies our government's current stem cell research policy. In March 2009, President Obama increased government funding for embryonic stem cell research and asked the National Institutes of Health to come up with guidelines for procuring research embryos. In, in, in July 2009, the guidelines authored res authorized research on human embryos that, quote, were created using in vitro fertilization for reproductive purposes, and were no longer needed for this purpose, and were donated by individuals who sought reproductive treatment, and who gave voluntary informed consent for the human embryos to be used in research purposes." End quote. Can we expect this policy to meet the demand of scientists for embryos? In 2002, the RAND Corporation did a study 
and estimated that the number of spare frozen embryos from fertility clinics would be about 400,000 embryos. Of those 400,000, they found that about 11,000 were slated for research. Then they ask, well, how many stem cell lines could you produce out of 11,000 embryos? The answer, about 275, best case scenario. Would this number be enough to meet the demand? The answer, well, it depends upon what scientists intend to do with them. And it's reasonable to believe that scientists will actually seek an indefinite supply of embryos. If we consider merely the pursuit of therapy, we would find scientists seeking, well, if we, we would find them seeking an indefinite supply of embryos. Suppose that a person has leukemia. If laws, in, if, if enabling laws were passed, such a patient could donate an embryo with leukemia for researchers to study and for companies to provide a therapy suited to that person's, that patient's immune system and physiology. Scientists, then, may well be looking for an indefinite and stable supply of embryos. The current government policy, based upon the principle of donation, makes this possible. Let me make the problem a little bit more concrete. There are two sources of embryos, cloning and in vitro fertilization. In cloning, the nucleus of a regular cell, say a, a skin cell, the nucleus is extracted and placed into an egg cell, which then begins to divide and become a new individual. In vitro fertilization, as I mentioned, takes a sperm and an egg and creates the embryo in a laboratory container. Both procedures require the woman, a woman to donate eggs. And IVF also requires a male to donate sperm. Of these two sources of embryos, IVF seems to be the cheaper, more abundant source because the strong desire for children in infertile couples motivates women to undergo the invasive procedure of removing their eggs and motivates couples to pay for the production of embryos. Otherwise, a researcher must pay a woman between five to $10,000 to donate eggs and then pay for the production of the embryos. Thus, it seems reasonable that for embryonic, embryonic stem cell researchers must see the population of married couples as an affordable and reliable source of embryos. Now let's step back for a minute and consider this problem in the larger context of marriage and family. From a Catholic perspective, the ethical questions raised by human embryonic stem cell research and reproductive technology are questions about begetting and educating, about how we have children and how we help them develop in order to survive and to live. Reproductive technology raises the question of begetting because it brings a child into existence. Embryonic stem cell research raises the question of educating because the destruction of embryos contradicts our desire and obligation to help the children develop whom we have begotten. In the oldest sense of the term, to educate means to bring up children by the supply of food and attention to physical wants. To educate in this sense begins then with the development of the child in the womb, or perhaps a petri dish supplied with the liquid culture necessary to sustain embryos until they are discarded, implanted, frozen, or destroyed by neglect or for research. How shall we know then if our ways of begetting and educating children are worthy of human society? Marriage, the sexual union of the spouses, and family naturally provide everything needed for begetting and educating. So let us look at what they have to offer. Then we shall look at how modern technology acts upon the sexual union, sometimes well, sometimes ill, with the goal of providing people with health and with children. I put on my slide 
a scheme of some of the basic points of Catholic teaching on marriage and sexuality. The goods of marriage are the union of a man and wife for the whole of life. From the perspective of married love, this union is fully human, meaning spirit it tends to the spiritual dimension. You must consent to be married. You cannot be forced. Also, fully, uh, fully human love in marriage has its bodily dimension as well. So we have the spiritual, the psychological, but also the biological and the physical union uh, and the physical gift of self in all of its human dimensions. From the perspective of the goods of marriage, they unite in order to help each other in all the different ways that life needs help, economically, educationally, but also spiritually. And it is the work, for example, of spouses to help each other grow in virtue. Also, the Catholic teaching recognizes that because they are married, the presence of each spouse to the other is a sign of a sacrament through which grace is given to each one. And also from the perspective of the goods of marriage, marriage is open to children, which perhaps raises the difficult issue of infertility. A childless couple is no less married for their infertility. They might be fruitful, fecund in other ways. They might also engage in a process of trying to, under, to discover the causes of infertility and overcome them, a source of healing within the body of the person. Let's then try to apply some of these concepts the, coming from the Catholic teaching on sexuality to the problem of in vitro fertilization. By uniting a man and a wife for life, marriage frees each spouse to love the other in one of the deepest possible ways that two human beings can love. Each spouse sees and loves certain characteristics of the other from the beginning and watches those characteristics develop over years, usually decades. As parents, they see and love the good in their children. They beget and watch them develop over years, usually decades. Children learn by watching their parents. In scientific terms, you might think of marriage and family as the perfect longitudinal study in character development. Marriage also makes the happiness of each spouse partially depend upon the other. The spouse's ability to become parents depends upon each one's ability and willingness to do so. Infertility causes so much sorrow because the person ability, personal ability cannot satisfy the desire for children. Infertility can be so difficult on a marriage because the natural dependence upon one's spouse is not matched by the ability to give what is needed for children. So some couples make themselves dependent upon the abilities of physicians and technicians. But in so doing, they replace the, the sexual act and they, repla they replace their sexual act with something different. They break the bond of their marriage, and they destroy some of their children. Being married makes the spouse's sexual intercourse to be an act unlike any other. Marriage makes sexual intercourse so unique that we give sex within marriage a particular name, the marital act. The marital act differs from any type of sexual intercourse outside of marriage such as fornication or adultery. Even more, then, does the marital act differ from a technological procedure that unites gametes without sexual intercourse at all. Sometimes I raise the issue of, of this teaching on sexuality in, a, in an undergraduate course by throwing off the, the following question. What makes sex good? And I get a silent response. <laughs> And maybe a girl over here turns a bit red. I can see them saying to myself, see them saying to themselves, I don't want to talk about this with him. He's a professor. And then somebody in the back kind of thinks, he's a professor, he's on to something. And so they say, well, what makes sex good? Babies. And I say, right. And also what makes what sex is good for 
is to unite a male and a female in all of the different ways the two human beings can be united, in a sense, a fully human way. It unites them in this fully human way as long as the two consent. If there is no consent, then the act is not sex but rape, which is an act of violence that uses sex as a weapon. Similarly, if there is no openness to procreation, then there is not a sexual act but a contraceptive act. Finally, if there is consent and a child but no act, then there is no true union, only a reproductive act that breaks that union. The marital act unites spouses in the most complete way the two people can be united. It unites them physically with the presence of the husband's sperm in the body of his wife. It may unite them biologically if a child is conceived. It unites them psychologically because each touches the other, is conscious of the other, and of all of the emotions, thoughts, beliefs, perceptions, and desires that each has for the other. Finally, sexual intercourse, the marital act, unites them spiritually in several ways. They freely choose this way of uniting themselves sexually that belongs to them alone, properly. Sex reflects the commitment that they have to, to remain with each other. They recognize that sexual intercourse may bring forth a child that they want or don't want or perhaps are conflicted about wanting. And whatever their feelings about their future child, sex unites them spiritually because their marital act may bring forth a child, which will belong to them. If nothing else, the contraceptive mentality provides the clearest evidence that sex unites lovers at the level of intellect and will, that is, spiritually. If they did not recognize the link between sex and procreation, why contracept? In the Theology of the Body, Pope John Paul II explores how the marital act unites spouses in every aspect of their personhood, body, spirit, subjectivity, and so on. Through their sexual union, the spouses know each other not only as masculine and feminine, but as a gift, unique and unrepeatable. Commenting on Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, now Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain. The Pope writes, When they become one flesh, the man and woman experience the meaning of their bodies in a particular way. Together, they thus become one single subject, as it were, of that act and that experience, although they remain two really distinct subjects in this unity. Conjugal union contains in itself a discovery of the meaning of the human body in its masculinity and femininity. Precisely through being man and woman, each of them is given to the other as a unique and unrepeatable subject, as I, as a person. End quote. By uniting physically in one flesh, the spouses unite in their knowledge of the masculinity and femininity that they share with every other person, and also the knowledge of the other as a unique and unrepeatable gift, one whom they do not share sexually with any other. Now, sexual intercourse unites a married couple in the most complete way that two people can be united. But in vitro fertilization breaks that union in a way that is analogous to sex outside of marriage. Physically, sex outside of marriage means that the sperm of the male is present in the body of the female, but both sperm and body could equally well be given to another. There's no promise. As with fornication and adultery, IVF gives them to another. Biologically, the child's origin is removed from the spouse's, spouse's bodily relationship. Psychologically, the child's origin is removed from their effective union. Spiritually, the spouses willingly allow their children to be brought into being by others in an environment thoroughly incapable of sustaining their existence, a laboratory container. In doing so, they place their children in the custody of strangers 
with only a legal contract requiring their return. Now, most couples who resort to in vitro fertilization and similar techniques undoubtedly do so with good intentions and great courage, it must be said. Going through IVF is a grueling experience. Listen for a moment of the account of one woman who went through this experience. She writes, we finished our first cycle of IVF in December. It was a long and challenging process. Injecting myself twice a day for two weeks was scary at first, but I got over my fear of needles very quickly and it just became a part of my everyday life. The side effects from the drugs were not much fun, but I coped. The cycle worked well and my body responded how it should. I went for EPU, egg pickup, on the 8th of December, 2010. This is a day surgery process and you are knocked out. I remember waking up in pain and crying. The nurses were lovely and gave me pain meds to help, which worked quickly. Being told they had picked up 14 eggs was amazing. I couldn't stop smiling. Out of the 14 eggs, only 13 were mature, still a great number. Now we had to wait to see how many would fertilize. We got eight, still a good number. On the 10th of December, we went in for ET, embryo transfer. This is the procedure in which the embryo is transferred back into the uterus of the woman. Due to my age, I was only able to have one put back in. We got a picture of our little four-celled embryo to keep. Out of the eight fertilized eggs, only seven made it through the four-cell stage, so we have six little embryos on ice if this first cycle doesn't work. The TWW, two-week wait, was awful, waiting and wondering if we are going to get our happy ending of pregnancy. I was on progesterone supplement, which mimics pregnancy symptoms, so I put everything, down, I was, everything I was feeling down to that. On the 21st, I decided to use an HPT, a pregnancy test. It was positive. Part of me wondered if it were still the drugs running through my system and thought they would have been long gone. So I did another pregnancy test on Wednesday, positive. I went to get my blood test the next day, positive. After almost 18 months of trying to conceive, I was pregnant. My husband and I could not stop smiling. I cried. So this is what it felt like to hear such amazing news. It's still only days, but we're hoping this little one decides to stick around. A difficult emotional, physical process, back and forth. The deep human attraction for children can lead, obviously, to intense suffering when children do not come. And infertility is surely common enough that each one of us will have friends struggling with this sadness. Envisioning one's future in a marriage without children is surely one of the hardest parts of this struggle. And so it may help to envision clearly one's future with children conceived through IVF. There will certainly be the joy of having children but there may also be lingering fears. One of the worst fears of a spouse is to lose one's spouse or one's children through one's own negligence. IVF makes both of these fears a reality, though often an imperceptible one. IVF produces children by producing more than enough embryos and then eliminating some. IVF also compromises the marital relationship by allowing others to replace the marital act and, in a way, replace the spouses themselves. Now, how about some good news? Ready for some good news? There are technologies to help married couples overcome fertility. IVF does nothing to overcome fertility. It doesn't address the causes of infertility. It might even make the infertility worse by exacerbating the causes. IVF gets around the causes of infertility. But there are technologies designed to address the causes of infertility. And there's also a principle to distinguish technologies that respect the marital relationship from those that do not. 
If a technology in, enables married couples to perform the marital act and to conceive a child through it, it's legitimate. If a technology replaces the marital act, then it is not legitimate. And so now you're asking yourself, how does one distinguish between the legitimate and the illegitimate, between those that assist the couple in performing the marital act that is rightly theirs to perform, and technologies that replace it? First, let's ask, what are the essential characteristics of sex and of conception? Well, rather than state the obvious, such as sex requires a male and a female, let me take a more scientific approach. A recent report from the National Institute of Child Health and Development states, quote, successful reproduction depends upon the normal anatomy and function of the male and female reproductive tracts and includes normal menstrual cycles and hormone function, gamete formation and development, fertilization, embryo development, implantation, fetal development, and completion of pregnancy to term, end quote. In this list, only the actual spouses and the marital act are missing. Otherwise, we have a helpful list. So here's a complete summary. Optimally, we need a healthy male and female, their consent, and sexual union. The union of a healthy sperm and an egg, the union of genetic material, embryonic development, implantation, fetal development, and birth. Now we can see a little bit more clearly how the marital act brings forth a new person. So then let's ask how te different technologies can assist this process, enabling the, the couple to perform a marital act that would lead to a child, and then we'll distinguish that from technologies that replace one or another parts of what you see on the board. First, acts that assist in the, and therefore are legitimate. Natural family planning techniques enable, enable couples to predict days of high fertility. Also, they might, uh, natural family planning techniques might also enable physicians to diagnose the causes of infertility and then develop some, some treatment for those causes. Physicians might prescribe hormone therapy to overcome or to help the wife ovulate, or if the problem is in the man, for example, to correct a low sperm count. Surgeons can open blocked tubes and correct anatomy. And then what about Viagra? Well, just look at the advertising. No, on second thought, don't look at the advertising. Look at the facts. What does Viagra do? Well, it corrects the functioning of a part of the body that's not functioning well. In that sense, it's therapeutic. If it enables a couple, a married couple, to perform the marital act that would lead to children, it overcomes a pathology. It's legitimate, notwithstanding the other uses to which that drug is put in our society. Consider a case of uh, the child is already conceived, and the woman's body need, needs help in maintaining the pregnancy. In, some, in these cases, progesterone therapy helps the, wife bo the wife's body to su sustain the pregnancy through its early stages. All of these medical interventions assist the couple to perform the act that is rightly theirs to perform so that a child might be conceived through it. By contrast, Procedures such as in vitro fertilization replace one of the events in the spouse's begetting of children. Artificial insemination, for example, uses an, instru an instrument to place sperm within the uterus. In so doing, replaces the sexual union of the couple. By replacing the sexual act, artificial insemination replaces the physical union of husband and wife and in a sense, replaces the husband. IVF takes this process a step further and replaces the woman, in a sense, by uniting the sperm and the egg in a glass container. The procedure achieves their biological union without them. 
the most radical procedure of all, cloning, replaces the union of genetic material with a mere transfer of genetic material from the body of an egg, from the from the a body cell to an egg cell, which is then capable of developing into a new individual. So cloning replaces the couple. It replaces sexual union, and it even replaces the union of sperm and egg. By replacing key events in the sexual union and origin of persons, these types of technologies enable technicians to replace the husband and wife and the marital act. Also, as I mentioned earlier, cloning and IVF are also the sources of embryos for stem cell research. So it is not surprising that scientists look at the population of married couples as an affordable, abundant supply of embryos. The techniques used to produce an embryo for infertile couples not only compromises their marital relationship, but quite frequently makes embryos available for a variety of purposes, including scientific research. The marital act that unites the spouses unites them in the most complete way that two, pe that, that two people can possibly be united, physically, biologically, psychologically, spiritually. When they freely unite in a way that may lead to children, the spouses express this total gift of self to each other. Without the consent, sexual union, and openness to life, their marital act is no longer an act of sexual intercourse. It's no longer a marital act, but something else. Rape, a contraceptive act, a reproductive act. And so in order to protect the integrity of the spouses, we might ask about the uses of re reproductive technology. Does this technology help the spouses give themselves fully to each other and realize their union? Or does it replace their union and in so doing, replace the spouses? And I hope this presentation 